and take average of all planes in R3. And we originally we were um, trying to generalize uh, Eckhart Vienna's theorem to higher dimensional uh, case for higher dimensional um, gamma. But we failed to prove it in full generality. Um, we just uh, um, we just obtained a partial result uh, for certain specific gamma. And in our, in our proof, we also um, generalized Ferry's theorem. We um, generalized this Ferry's theorem for higher dimensional gamma. So um, I will give a proof of this higher dimensional version of Ferry's theorem first, and then I give a um, partial proof of the higher dimensional case of um, ekholm height Reynolds theorem. To do so, the first thing we need to do is generalize the curvature. So the, we have to generalize this one-dimensional curvature to the, the higher-dimensional curvature. And we are going to use um, the total absolute curvature. which was um, introduced by Chun and Lashoff. Given n-dimensional submanifold of Rm, we have to consider its unit normal bundle. So M, N1M, called unit normal bundle. And it's the union of all P and mu, where P is a point of M, and mu is perpendicular to the tangent plane of M, and its length equals 1. So, given M, the unit normal bundle roughly looks like this. So, roughly it's the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of M. So um, for, for this P, we have the fiber. Of to, to define fiber, we have to introduce the natural projection, pi, which is the map from unit normal bundle onto M, defined by pi P nu equal to P. So this set is fiber of the point P. Then fiber of a point P is homeomorphic to the unit sphere of dimension M minus N minus 1. So the dimension of the unit normal bundle equals sum of these two, n, sum of n and this dimension. So it's m minus 1. So unit normal bundle is roughly a hypersurface in Rm. And you can define the volume form of unit normal bundle, which is dVm, the volume form of M, 
which the sigma m minus n minus 1, which is restricted to the fiber is the volume form of the unisphere. And we can define the Gauss map. from unit normal bundle onto the unit sphere in RM. Gauss map written as capital G. So G maps P nu onto P. I'm sorry, not P, but nu. And now we can define curvature called Lipschitz scaling curvature. Lipschitz killing curvature GP nu is defined to be the limit as the domain in um, unit normal bundle approaches the point set. Of the ratio of the volume of the image under the Gauss map. Um, Okay, um, let's, let's use the sub-index n here. Image under the Gauss map of the domain D divided by volume of the domain D. So in this volume, we count the, uh, the orientation and the multiplicity. So in, in other words, this um, Lipschitz killing curvature is determinant of the Gauss map. For this definition of Lipschitz killing curvature, if we have a hypersurface Mn in R n plus 1, in this case, the Lipschitz killing curvature is exactly equal to the gauss kronecker curvature. And in the general case, in this general case, the lipschitz killing curvature, GP nu, is equal to the gauss kronecker curvature. at P of the orthogonal projection. Of M onto the N plus one dimensional plane. L of new spanned by by the tangent plane of manifold M and the unit normal nu. So for example, if we have a circle on this vertical plane, and here's P, 
and m is one dimensional circle. If u is pointing in this direction on this unit circle, then g p nu is one. But if nu is pointing in this horizontal direction, then g p nu one equals zero. That's because if you uh, consider the tangent, uh, the two plane spanned by this tangent line and nu, which is the horizontal plane, if you project m1 onto horizontal plane, it, we have a line segment. Its curvature is zero. So we have Gauss uh, Lipschitz killing curvature zero. With Lipschitz killing curvatures, we can define several um, total curvatures. First, we take integral over the fiber. Then, this is called the total curvature. of m at p. Here, c m minus 1 is the volume of the unisphere. Then, this total curvature is intrinsic quantity. When m is even. Total curvature is zero if n is odd. And we introduce another total curvature, k star of p, which is one over c m minus one. Integral of the absolute value of Lipschitz killing curvature. And this is called total absolute curvature. Of M at P. We obtain different type of total curvature. Here we integrate again, integrate the total curvature at P over all points of M. Then this is called um, total curvature. Of M and integrate k star to the absolute curvature at p over all points. And th this is called total absolute curvature. Of m. This total absolute curvature is invariant. Even if we extend the ambient space, M was assumed to be in the space Rm. Even if we extend the ambient space from Rm to Rk, this quantity, total absolute curvature of M, is the same. And 
for this definition of total curvatures, function prove the following. Total curvature of M is equal to the Euler characteristic of M. And Fenchel also showed that in case M is one dimensional, the total absolute curvature, this is in fact equal to 1 over pi times total curvature of the curve. And he proved that this quantity is always bigger than or equal to 2 if divided by pi. And equality holds if and only if um, M1 is a convex planar curve. And Chan and Lashoff generalized Fenchel's result for higher dimension. They showed that total absolute curvature is at least 2, and equality holds if and only if M is a convex hypersurface. In n plus 1 dimensional plane, plane in Rm. And they proved that total absolute curvature, if total absolute curvature is small, like smaller than 3, then M is homeomorphic to Sn. And they also showed that total absolute curvature and is bigger than or equal to the sum of Betty numbers. And they used most theory to prove this inequality. And is there any call about being standard differential structure? Extendable? Less than three? Less than three for this case? Yeah, homeomorphism on me, yeah. So that's an unsolved problem, or is that maybe, maybe it's an unsolved problem, but yeah. They considered the homeomorphic case only. Remember that theory proved the following. For the one-dimensional Jordan curve, the total curvature is equal to the average over all planes in R3. Of the total curvature of the projection onto the plane P. And um, we want to generalize this to higher dimensional gamma. So uh, we have the following theorem. Theorem 1. Gamma is n minus 1 dimensional compact surface in Rm. And we showed that Cn minus 1 over 2 times total absolute curvature is equal to the average over all n planes in Rm of the total gauss chronicle curvature of the projection 
onto the plane, orthogonal projection onto the plane. Here, psi p is orthogonal projection from Rm onto P. Yeah, n dimensional plane. And this is Grassmannian, the set of all oriented n planes in Rm. Um, to prove this theorem, first note this. We, ha we, we have to take the average here. So um, we have to have the volume form of this Grassmannian. So d mu nm is the volume form of the Grassmannian. And for this um, total absolute curvature at p, we innovated over the over the fiber. So the, the volume form of this fiber is um, d sigma n minus n. This is the volume form of the fiber. Okay? So the first thing we need to do is um, evenly divide the volume from d mu mn by the volume form of the fiber. So to do so, we have to show the following. The Grassmannian is S m minus n cross G lower dimensional Grassmannian. I don't mean this as a set theoretic product, but I mean this as a major theoretic product. So I want to have this cross product uh, almost everywhere. So choose any p, n dimensional plane in this Grassmannian. And let's um, consider um, the orthogonal complement of gamma per, orthogonal complement of gamma. Then the dimension of p plus dimension of orthogonal complement is equal to dimension of P is N, and dimension of orthogonal complement of gamma is M minus N plus 1. So there are some equals M plus 1, which is bigger than the dimension of the ambient space. So this means that the dimension of P intersected with orthogonal complement is, at, is equal to 1. Not always, but almost everywhere. Okay. So this implies that there exists a unique normal vector in the unique normal bundle, mu, which is in, um, not only in the unique normal bundle, but also in P. For example, um, consider P, plain P. Plain P, and this is the tangent plane to the gamma. Then you can find 
a vector in P, a vector Ada in P, which is perpendicular to the tangent space to uh, gamma. So for each, this is um, fiber. So for each n plane P, we found a unit normal vector in this fiber. Okay. And there are infinitely many n planes which give rise to the same unit normal vector eta. So uh, let's collect all of them, which give um, unit normal vector eta. But ac actually, um, eta is determined up to sine. You can also have minus eta. So let's find the set of all n planes um, um, giving us the same vector eta. And that's um, easy to find. Any, just consider any n, n plane containing eta. So all these uh, n planes uh, give us the same eta. So let's consider this this n minus one plane. P is n plane and eta is one vector. So we have n minus one plane in P plane, n plane P. Okay? So we call this P1. And P1 is actually a subspace of um, eta pop. And eta pop is n minus one dimensional. And P1 is n minus one dimensional. So P1 can be thought of as an element in this Grassmannian. So the set of all P planes containing eta have one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the points in this Grassmannian. So for each P, we can define eta and P1. And P1 lies in this um, Grassmannian. Actually, we have a uh, one-to-two correspondence because of, uh, we could have eta or minus eta. So this way, uh, we have a one to two correspondence between P planes and eta P1. So this is the way we obtain major theoretic uh, cross product of this Grassmannian um, in terms of um, sphere and lower dimensional Grassmannian. For example, G23, G203 is homeomorphic to S2, and this can be thought of, S2 can be thought of as homeomorphic to S1 cross S1. In other words, we have an equator in S2, and through each point on this equator, we have this longitude. So um, we have S1 here, and we have another S1 here. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay, then let's um, consider this time the, the volume form d mu m n and d sigma m minus n and d mu m minus 1 and n minus 1. So this volume form is which product of these two volume forms? And we have to add um, correction factor, which we denote by f of p. So in this case, in this um, G2, R, G2, R3, correction factor is the uh, well-known um, 
formula um, d theta and d phi. Theta is angle along the equator, and phi is the angle along this latitude. Then the correction factor in this sphere is cosine phi. Okay. So let's get the FP for the general um, for the general um, Grassmannian manifold. Then the, the correction factor f of p is in fact the, the determinant of the orthogonal projection of L eta pulp onto p pulp. L eta is the N plane containing the tangent plane to the gamma and unit normal eta. Okay. And this determinant is nothing but the determinant of the orthogonal projection of L of eta onto P. We can prove this by using Jacobi's theorem. Jacobi proved that given an orthogonal matrix M, orthogonal, and A and D are squares, square matrices. In other words, matrix M is blocked into A, B, and C, D. A and A and D are square matrices, but they don't have to have the same size. Still, determinant of A absolute value equals determinant of D. From this Jacobi's theorem, we can prove the, this equality. And moreover, the, so FP relates these two, um, these two, the um, volume forms, but F to F of P, sorry, FP. FP also relates the Gauss chronicle curvature. Gauss chronicle curvature of the orthogonal projection of gamma onto L of eta and Gauss chronicle curvature of the orthogonal projection of gamma. And the relationship between these two is The, this author, the uh, correction factor is good, f of p is good. Okay, so using these two observations, this and this, we can prove theorem one. So we want to prove this, this theorem so let's start from the right hand side. The right hand side is equal to, we are taking the average. So take integral over all Grassmannian space. So um, P in and divide by the measure of the Grassmannian, which we denote by G and M. So this is the average of this integral. So we, we take integral, this integral over here, Gauss chronicle curvature. And this volume form is the volume form of uh, uh, this set.
Then let's uh, change the order of integration. So um, change the order of integration, and let's lift the integral from this projection onto um, the, the original gamma. So let's lift uh, from this set to gamma. Then the integral becomes like this. Okay. 1 over g n m over integ integral over gamma and integral over p in g n r m. And when we lift the integral from this set to gamma, we have to have um, a factor, which is the same as f of p. So we have factor f of p here. And then all the remainings are the same. Gauss Kronecker curvature and V mu and M dV. dV is actually over gamma. Okay. Here dV is over the set. Okay. And the Gauss Kronecker curvature, more precisely, this is the Gauss Kronecker curvature of the projection of gamma. And this equals 1 over g n m integral over gamma. And now let's use the decomposition of the, this Grassmannian into, into this product, into this product. So you have to use this volume form. Okay? So we, we gain another f of p. Therefore, um, this Grassmannian becomes um, the fiber and lower dimensional Grassmannian, which is the set of all n planes containing eta. So we, we have another f of p, so we have fp squared and gk psi p gamma d mu m minus 1, n minus 1, d sigma m minus n, dv gamma. So we de decomposed Grassmannian into the fiber, fiber and lower dimensional Grassmannian. Okay. But in this decomposition, I, I said this one to one. This is not a one to one map. This is a one to two map. So uh, we have to have factor of two here. Then we use this relationship. Fp squared gauss kronecker curvature, this is equal to um, gauss kronecker curvature um, of the projection onto this plane, L of eta. So this becomes um, 2 g n m gamma eta. Gauss Kronecker curvature of psi L of eta gamma. But this doesn't depend on P. P is the set of all P pl n planes containing eta. But this is independent of P. So integral over this is the integral of constant function. This is a constant function. So we can just, um, the integral of this becomes this quantity times the volume of lower dimensional um, Grassmannian, which is g n minus 1, n minus 1. So here we have just d sigma n minus n dv 
كما Now we know that this Gauss chronicle curvature is in fact the Lipschitz Kellen curvature, which was proved by uh, Chairman Lashoff. So we have this Gauss chronicle curvature is equal to the Lipschitz Kellen curvature. And the ra ratio between these two measures of the Grassmannians is equal to C n minus 1 over 2 C n minus 1. Now we have the integral of this Gauss, this uh, Lipschitz Kinnan curvature over the fiber. This is exactly the definition of the total absolute curvature at Q, K star. So we have n minus 1 over 2 integral along gamma of k star dv. Okay. So this total absolute curvature of gamma is equal to the average of average of the um, total gauss kronk curvature over the all or uh, n planes. Okay. So this is the um, theorem one. Okay, then let's go to theorem two. Um, before theorem two, let me introduce cone angle. Pi Q is a radial projection of R M minus Q onto the inner sphere centered at Q. In other words, this inner sphere centered at Q uh, here we have gamma, and we have radial projection toward the center of the sphere, pi q. Then we have this image, and take the volume of the image. So volume of the image under the radial projection is defined to be denoted by pi q and it's called cone angle of gamma at q. So this is a generalization of the, the usual angle on the plane. For this definition of cone angle, we have the following theorem. The cone angle of an n minus one dimensional complex set is equal to the average over all p planes in Rm. The average of the cone angles of the projection, orthogonal projection. Simply speaking, the cone angle is the average of the cone angles of all the projections. Okay. And let's consider a special case. Here we have circular arc. Um, here we have a circle and consider an arc on, on this circle. Okay. Call it gamma and choose any point Q. Okay. Then its projection, orthogonal projection, yeah. orthogonal projection of the circular arc and compute the cone angle at this point. 
then this cone angle of the projection depends on P. So this value varies uh, depending on the position of P. However, if you choose the total, the whole set, the full set, full circle as gamma, and choose any point Q here, then the cone angle of the thermal projection of the circle, gamma, is always equal to 2 pi. And for the proof of this theorem 2, uh, we use this observation. In this independent of p. For any p, uh, this cone angle is always 2 pi. Theorem 3, sigma m is an Rm, and it's minimal. Then the n-dimensional density of sigma at Q is bounded above by 1 over Cm minus 1 of the cone angle of the boundary. And proof is uh, not so complicated. You introduce the distance function. R is the distance. R of x is the distance from P to x in Rm, ambient distance function. Then Laplacian of R squared equals 2 n on sigma. And R to the 2 minus n on sigma is superharmonic. And it has singularity at the, put, at the point Q. The same singularity as the uh, Green's function. So it's better to have a uh, notation like this, uh, direct delta function. And if you have, if you consider the cone from, P, from Q over the boundary of R to the 2n, 2 minus n, then this is equal to direct delta function on the cone. So combining these two, um, we can obtain this quantity, this uh, desired inequality. So the integral of this function gives us this quantity, and integral of this gives, gives us this uh, cone angle estimate. So we get, um, we have the density of the minimal surface, um, I, I mean, we have the upper bound of the density um, in terms of the cone angle of the boundary. And finally, we have theorem 4. Gamma 1 and gamma 2 are compact convex hypersurfaces of n planes P1 and P2 respectively, in Rm. Then, gamma 1 union gamma 2 spans an embedded connected minerals of, maybe I should say, uh, all the minimums of manifolds, then any 
Think about submanifold. Submanifold. Sigma spanned by gamma is n dimensional minimum of manifold is either connect embedded and connected or gamma is union of D1 and D2. Here, these two are totally geodesic. Okay. Well, we can prove the theorem 4 using theorems 1, 2, 3. Okay, let's start from the density. Cn minus 1 density of the minimal surface is bounded above by cone angle gamma. Gamma is more of gamma 1 and gamma 2. And this is by theorem 3. And by theorem 2, this cone angle is equal to the average of all P in Rm of the cone angles of the projection. And this is by theorem 2. And this cone angle of the projection, by our assumption, this is very strong hypothesis, convex hyper, con, compact convex hypersurface. So if you project it onto a P plane, you still have com, compact convex hypersurface. So it, it's cone angle. Cone angle is, OK. Consider this set. And Q, suppose Q is here. Sorry. This point is here. Okay. And suppose this is um, projection of gamma. Projection of gamma is convex, compact hypersurface. So it's cone angle. This cone angle is equal to the total gauss kronecker curvature. On this, here we are using that strong hypothesis. It's convex and um, compact hypersurface, so it's cone angle. From viewed from this point, interior point, is equal to the total gauss kronecker curvature. Okay? But for, for this convex hypersurface, total gauss kronecker curvature is equal to um, C, the, Total gauss chronicle curvature of this is the same as the total gauss chronicle curvature of the unisphere, which is Cn minus 1. Okay. So we have Cn minus 1 for each component, gamma 1 and gamma 2. And we, we take the average over all P n planes in Rm. But here we, we have to be careful, because this point might might be in the outside, in the exterior. In that case, cone angle viewed from this exterior point is smaller than the total gauss kronecker curvature. So we have inequality here, like this. And So we have um, 2 C n minus 1. So by factoring out, we 
get this estimate. The density is always smaller than or equal to 2. Okay? So we get the desired um, um, conclusion. Um, at first, um, we thought this inequality holds for any, um, for any gamma, but unfortunately, we found a counterexample. So we have the following um, conjecture. As, as Chan and Lashev showed, the total absolute curvature is at least two. So the smallest interval for the total absolute curvature would be two, between two and four. Okay. So we, we have the following conjecture. If the total absolute curvature of gamma is less than four, then any minimal submanifold spanned by gamma is embedded. Um, <coughs> in fact, um, by we, ha we haven't used theorem 1 yet. But if you use theorem 1, this equals um, Cn minus 1 over 2 integral over gamma by theorem 1. So by this conjecture, if this total absolute curvature is less than 4, then we have 2 Cn minus 1. So we have density estimate, which is less than two. So we get the embeddedness. So all we need to prove, to prove conjecture is this. We, we need to prove uh, this inequality. So um, for that, to, to prove that inequality, um, we have one more conjecture. So if we can prove this conjecture, then we can prove this, uh, this strong conjecture. But if sigma is minimal, spanning gamma, then the common angle of the projection is equal to total Gauss chronicle curvature of the projection. For all Q. The counterexample for this uh, inequality we found is this. This is one dimensional gamma. And uh, this is planar Jordan curve. And rotate it, this around this vertical line. Then we get the two-dimensional closed surface. And uh, if Q is here, if Q is here, then um, I mean, if we had Q here, and if this were Q, then we get we have the the opposite inequality. For this point Q, the common angle is bigger than the total Gauss chronicle curvature. But um, if we have the project projection of the point, the point P, the point Q is assumed to be in minimal surface. Then we think that the, we, we should have the desired uh, inequality. But if um, Q is not the projection of a point on the minimal surface, then we have uh, this, this counterexample. So um, for the minimal surface, 
spent by this gamma is actually three-dimensional linear surface spanned by the, or this two-dimensional boundary is actually the interior. And in that case, the Q is always um, in, the, in the interior. So this bad counterexample uh, doesn't occur. So I, I think um, this, this conjecture is still um, valid, even though we have a counterexample like this. So once we can prove this conjecture, then we can prove this higher dimensional version of Ekholm-White and Reynolds theorem. Yeah, I'll stop here.